Well, hello, everybody. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to chat with the one and only Nick Hopkins <laughs> today. Um, Nick uh, is uh, really the first neurosurgeon in the modern era who took on um, treating vascular disorders of the brain and central nervous system uh, through endovascular techniques and has been a pioneer and a leader in this revolution that has changed the way we treat vascular disease today and is directly personally responsible for training the majority of the neurosurgical leadership in the space. And it's, it's my absolute privilege and honor to have been associated with him for the last almost 17 years and learn from him and follow him and be inspired by him. And so it's, it's a delight to welcome you, Nick. How are you? Thanks, Adnan. Doing fine. Did you say 17 years? Yes, boss. Oh, my God. It's been a while. <laughs> I've been around. Oh, Lord. I know. I know you feel like it's 30, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been such an incredible opportunity and pleasure for me to spend this time with you guys. It's been, you know, amazing. I'm a, a very lucky dude. Well, let's start with that. So, yes, you have been a very lucky dude. Um, if you had to sort of state what is that one central quality uh, that has allowed you to be a very lucky dude? Was it, I mean, I think there's always an element of luck, but this is really a conversation about inspiring other trend breakers. And if you had to look at your own career, what is that one quality that you could identify in yourself that helped you be successful? Yeah, that's tough. Um, well, I'm actually trying to, you guys have been bugging me for years, and I'm actually going to try to do a book. I've got some help. And, and that's one of the questions that I get asked by my associate all the time. Um, I think if if anything, it's just a a little bit of the renegade in me and the unwillingness to um, listen to people who are trying to tell me what to do. I don't know what it is, it's, but but I've always had a a kind of a, a basic resistance to people telling me what to do from the time I was in grade school and um I, so one of the things that we've been talking about is the word no and i'm fine until somebody says no to me and when somebody says no to me I, it gets me fired up and 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 then if i get some crazy idea and somebody and that's always what happens when you get some crazy idea and you ask people about it and they'll and they all tell you, well, that's that's probably not possible. Um, that's what gets me going. And so back when I was a resident, I, um, you know, I started fooling around with catheters. First of all, we learned how to do angiography by sticking a needle in somebody's neck in the carotid artery. And then I saw that there were some radiologists who were starting to explore the lower parts of the body by, you know, putting um catheters in the leg or the arm and um so i i just thought well I, if i can get into the artery someplace then it's a direct shot to the base of the brain which is where all the vascular trouble is that we deal with and then i had i think i had an epiphany when i was scrubbed with one of our senior neurosurgeons i was a resident and uh, we was trying to clip an aneurysm and it was at a time we didn't have microscopes, we didn't have micro instruments, we didn't have anything except basic tools that you would use for a GI procedure. And and of course he ruptured the aneurysm and and I stood there with a sucker in my hand trying to stop the flow and eventually the poor guy bled out on the table. And that was for me, and that was in the that was in the let's see. 
it was in the early 70s. And I just said, geez, there's got to be a better way. And 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 then uh, during my residence, every chance I had, I was sticking needles in patients and animals and everything and putting catheters wherever I could. And um, and that that's that's how I got started. But it all it all began with somebody telling me you can't do that. So and I think that's that's been true my my whole life. Does that help? Yeah, so I ab- it absolutely does because if I had to answer that question for you, I would say it's your dogged determination to persist and persevere de- despite the opposition. And uh, but but there's an aspect to that which is typically speaking, um, when somebody comes in and is obstinate and is determined to do it one way or the other, they have. High, a high likelihood of being wrong. Um, but you have proven to the contrary where you your instincts have been much more spot on. And so what is it about that sort of creative intuition that allows you to sort of see things a little bit more clearly and I assume it was not something that happened, you know, overnight that you developed that skill. So if you had to look back and say, uh, for example, this concept that, hey, if you could just put a big enough tube there to suck something out for a stroke or to put a filter to protect debris from going into the brain for carotid disease or all those other ideas uh, that you've had making something move uh, to improve the efficiency of aspiration. How did you come upon just such a massive slew of good ideas? What do you what do you put that spot on intuition to? So we're not talking about the opposition. We'll come to that in a second. But you've been much more successful with coming up with the right ideas. How did that happen? You know, I think uh, if I've had, you know, five good ideas. I've had 500 terrible ideas. So I, I think that's another, that's another thing that is really uh, important in life is learning from failure. And God knows I've failed at so many things. Um, but um, if you can try to take lessons learned from failure and then just slowly keep working on them, um, then, you know, that, that can sometimes get you through. And then people um, have said to me many times, you know, you're like a goddamn bulldog. If you get a bite out of somebody's rear end, you'll never let go. And, and that's another, I think, really important part is persistence um, and a belief that what you're doing really makes sense. So if you really believe something is, is worth doing and you've got the, you know, the willingness to, Lived through a lot of slings and arrows, <laughs> which, <laughs> as you know, uh, we have uh, over the years. If you're willing to put up with all that, um, then, you know, and, and just keep going, keep persisting, then, you know, every now and then a light goes on and you make a step forward. And that's, I've been lucky enough to have that happen to me a, a bunch of times. But it, the slings and arrows have been really, in retrospect, lots of fun. I mean, Everybody in the beginning thought I was just a curiosity, and then and then I remember the radiologists were, thought they were gonna they were gonna take over this field, and because they had learned how to do angiography from, neuros, from neurosurgery fifty years ago, and and I, you know, so I would go to radiology meetings, and I would have the leadership in those meetings saying, "There's this crazy renegade neurosurgeon out there in the audience someplace." And I don't care if he's listening to me, but uh, he's got no business, you know, in our field. And meanwhile, I'm thinking they got no business in our field because, okay, they can use catheters, but they don't know what the heck they're doing. And and if something goes wrong, they're screwed. If something goes wrong for a neurosurgeon, we know how to operate on somebody and open the head and take care of it and fix it. So I've always thought from the beginning, that was a, you know, kind of a pillar of my 
uh, thinking we can do this. And, and so, although I got a lot of problems from great friends, um, I, I was always buoyed by the belief that, you know, this, this, this is, this is what needs to happen. Neurosurgery needs to be run in this field and by golly, that's what's happened. And I'll never forget one major debate where I was debating my old friend Spetzler and he was um, showing a whole lot of sides about how surgery is much better than catheters, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and I would agree with him for some things, but, uh, for other things, you know, I absolutely believe that that the catheter-based approach was better. So he f- ended up with some really, you know, like he always does. He's got the absolutely magnificent images of how he fixed some impossible vascular lesion. And all I did was put up a, I, I, got, I got from in, I got the graph of the volume of patients being done endovascular versus surgery and they had already crisscrossed <laughs> endovascular was always was already doing more cases and today i would venture a guess that that endovascular neurosurgery is probably 65 70% of all neurovascular procedures you'd know better than i but it, it, absolutely but, um, Th- that part is true um but okay so but i i want to focus on one thing and then I will we'll come to your 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 favorite neurosurgical buddies next but <laughs> uh so there's a little um contradiction because you talked about being dogged uh, in your sort of pursuit of what you thought you wanted to do yet uh, you are also very appreciative of learning through failure uh but learning through failure means you modify your approach uh, how do you balance modifying an approach and still being dogged about pursuing a particular direction? So, um, and what I mean by that is the goal and separating it from the path, the journey to the particular goal. So how can, if there was something you could advise uh, the next trailblazers, how do you balance learning from failure with being dogged and pursuing a particular idea? Yeah, I think that learning is an incremental thing and you don't learn at all in one failure. But when you do a procedure, I mean, you know, we all experienced it when you do a procedure and and you, you know, damage some major vessel or brain structure, you know, you you sweat about it for, you know, days. And and I, you know, I remember maybe the greatest neurosurgeon that ever lived, Charlie Drake, who, and when I, I went to visit him, it was an absolutely amazing experience for me because um, I, 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 I went to the OR with him, watched him operate, and, um, and he was just blazing a trail for basilar aneurysms at that point. And, um, and I saw a patient where you know, he obviously clipped a perforator and the patient never woke up. And so the next day on rounds, um, Charlie was beside himself, like, God, how did I do this? How could this happen? And just beating himself up. Um, and, and this went on for, you know, five to 10 minutes. Uh, this patient was never going to wake up. And then the next day on rounds, oh, God, how did I screw that up? And then like the third day, he didn't hardly even remember the patient. And I said, my God, (laughs) how could that be? And he said, he said to us, you know, you have to, when you're dealing with this kind of illness, you have to compartmentalize your life. So you wring everything you can out of it when you make a mistake and you hurt somebody. You wring everything you can out of it, out of it. And then then you let it settle and then you tuck it away. And then the next time, maybe you don't make exactly the same mistake. You're still going to make mistakes. But, but each time you make a mistake, 
hopefully you get a little better. And isn't, and isn't that exactly what happened with him? Eventually, he figured it all out. And all you got to do is not clip a perforator. And, and you can do well. And that was a huge lesson for me. Learn from the mistake. Don't, you know, beat yourself up, but not forever. And once you've accomplished uh, and learned as much as you can, you've got to put it behind you or you'll, you know, you'll never succeed. Yeah. I don't know. Does that make sense? Oh, that that is the absolute key. I think uh, the, the what I'm hearing is compartmentalization where you really, you know, you, you have a vision of where you want to go, but failures come along the way. And yeah, yeah. if you suffer, you need to so self-flagellate to some extent uh, to make sure that you are cognizant of what went wrong and then interpret that and then make the appropriate moves. Now, right. another aspect which is sort of interesting and people may not recognize is that, you know, you really got started as a phenomenal microsurgeon. You, know, you had the largest series of posterior circulation bypasses at one time. I think it might still stand. Um, and all your peers were these absolute larger than life gods of vascular neurosurgery. Um, your travel group that you um, talk so much about, uh, every single one of them really became the biggest shot in their space, in their region for vascular neurosurgery. How was it that in this particular group where you were, I mean, there was some, some, uh, humor in there, but there was some sort of dismissiveness as well with your own closest friends in terms of the pursuit that you had for endovascular and leaving your home turf to join this sort of non-existential neurosurgical presence in endovascular. How did you deal with that type of adversity from your own closest friends and peers? Yeah, I don't think it's much different. I think if you've got, like, when I started doing deep posterior fossa bypasses, I mean, bypasses were catching on fire. And, um, but people weren't doing bypasses way down deep. And then I don't know if I was the first or whatever, but, but it dawned on me that if you could access those deep vascular structures, then if you could, if you could, develop the ability to actually open an artery up down at the base of the brain and connect another another artery to it. Um, you know, by then we had the microscope, we had pretty decent micro instruments and the, um, the opportunity to do that was there. And so, you know, like most of us do, when we want to do something different, what do we do? We go to the lab and we get uh, cadavers or whatever. And we, practice. Um, we used animals, we used cadavers. Um, and then, you know, uh, my Bonnie would tell you that uh, I would bring home these, these, you know, cadaver blood vessels all the time. And I'd be at the kitchen table, <laughs> sewing them together. <laughs> and um, so you, you just keep working away at something. And then I was able to do a bunch of those bypasses, um, but but it's, it's it's the same thing. It's just it's persistence, and it's it's practice, and it's um, it's just you know don't once you get uh, once you get a, a start, don't let go. Now I, I think of you know uh, some of the friends that I have in the space, um, and we you know. Uh, I'll, a majority of them are people who wear the buffalo colors um, and uh, were brought up by you where you know the complete vascular surgeon uh, is somebody who can do it both endovascularly and microsurgically and th that's been true but you were sort of arguing in a, in a different direction with your peers and i wonder you didn't so you had a social group who was very, very close, but professionally, you're a little bit of, at odds. I mean, think of, you know, the countless debates between you and Spetzler on the topic. I mean, every annual meeting was not complete without the classic Spetzler-Hopkins battle. Um, <laughs> how, uh, how did that play into, 
I, I wonder if I would have had the, the guts to really go against my closest peers and not just join in at some point because you're already doing what they were doing is how did you manage that and still have the deepest fondest relationships? So trying to figure I out. Think that it, I think it's because uh, uh, our friendship ran so deep that we could trust each other. And Spetzel used to run around telling everybody the reason that I started doing <laughs> endovascular work is because I was no good at surgery. <laughs> And um, then I really got him back when I was giving some some named lecture and I got our medical illustrator to put his head on a dinosaur and, and named it Spetzosaurus. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think when a friendship goes as deep as ours, you can do anything you want with each other and, and get away with it and have fun with it. And so we always we always have. And I've just been so lucky to have him not only as a great friend, but he and Nancy introduced us to things in life that we never would have done on our own. I mean, we've we've taken hikes in the mountains where other people would, would cower. And and we just, I mean, because he's doing it, we got to follow him. And and so so our whole lives have been changed by that incredible friendship that we've had. You know, another big area of your life, which has been about entrepreneurship. And I think entrepreneurship is something which was appropriate given the fact that you were starting a new field with very few implements. But beyond that, how do you describe your, your keys to success in terms of a physician with ideas uh, who has the entrepreneurial spirit? What is your best guide to those who have similar ideas? And looking at your own personal experiences, what really worked for you here? Yeah, my experience was, I think, much more um, good luck. Um, I, I, I was asked to give a lecture at a TCT meeting about um, carotid stenting. And I chose to pick the topic of, look, if we're going to crack plaques in the neck, we're going to get strokes. And so I, I, it was a plea to industry to come up with a way to protect the brain when you crack a plaque in the neck. And I came down off the podium after that lecture, and it was a big group. And this guy walked up and, um, and said, you know, my name's Fred Kashravi, and I wonder if I could show you something. And I said, well, sure, why not? I didn't, I didn't even know what entrepreneurship really meant. But then we met a few weeks later at another meeting. And uh, he had a little device that was, um, you could, it was, a, it was attached to a wire. And it was a little nitinol ring in the bottom and a polyethylene mesh above. And you could squeeze it down into a really small catheter. So you could put that catheter up um, and slide it across the lesion and then push the little filter out and catch all the debris when you did the carotid stent. And then it had this unique little hinge on it so that when you pulled it back into the catheter, it collapsed and trapped all the, deb the debris in the filter. And so um, I, I, I was overwhelmed by this. And he said, well, do you want to start a company? And I was like, what? <laughs> and he had been working for other companies, uh, but had just finally decided it was time to branch out and launch his own company. So he and I uh, started a company. I was just the clinical uh, guy in that company. And he had a, a dear friend, uh, um, Amr Salahaya, who had invented that device six months before and didn't know what to do with it. And so we um, we got the company going, and and Fred um, grew it, and I was I was lucky enough to be the clinician along by his side, and um, and then in eighteen months we sold it to Boston Scientific, and um, I'll never forget when I showed this little device to our daughter Margie, you said, Dan, the thing the, the, the thing looks just like a condom. <laughs> and um, so 
but it worked and uh, it became worldwide. It became a really uh, important device. And gosh, when you think about if you can help a lot of people all at once with one little device, and, and we as surgeons can only help people one at a time. And so I, I was just overwhelmed by, by this. And, 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 and then Fred, fortunately for me, invited me to, to join a, 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 you know, a series of companies with him. And, and I learned, you know, I would travel to the West Coast where he was uh, whenever there was an, a meeting or whatever. And, um, and I just gradually learned about him and his incredible skill set. And, and not only that, but he may be one of the most wonderful people that I've ever, ever known. I mean, <laughs> he's an Iranian Kurd whose dad forced him out of the country during the revolution because it's, it was getting so ugly. And he, to this day, you know, he furthers the Kurdish causes in, in Iran. And, um, and he's just such a dear friend. It just, we, we've gotten so close. And it's almost like, my gosh, I don't, um, he, if I'm thinking something, I, I know he probably knows what, what, I, what I'm thinking because we're just so close and he's just such a special human being. So I'm um, very lucky. And so advice to other people is, um, boy, don't get sucked into every little, you know, people come along with ideas all the time. Don't get sucked into the little piddly ones. And you find somebody that that is you can really trust who really knows what he's doing. And then if you can join forces with somebody like that, then it really gets to be a lot of fun. And if you're lucky, then all success. Now that's, that's so inspiring because I, I, I think what this describes is, is, is a true lifelong partnership with, with a, the, a trusting friend who brings the business skill and the engineering acumen, and then you have the clinical expertise. And it's a true partnership which results in success, which would not be possible if you as the physician were trying to be the business leader no. or the engineer, or the engineer was trying to be the clinician. So it's that partnership that it's, it's groups of people coming together rather than one sort of quitting their day job and, and learning yeah. a whole new set of skills. If you see a physician who's started a company and, and he wants you to join him and, and you look at the physicians running the company, you run for the hills. That's not what you want. You got to have somebody who understands, as you say, the engineering and the business side of thing. And physicians just don't as a general rule. I never did. And the only reason that I you know, began to learn was because of Fred. And, and that took a long time. So, so when so this thing that you did in Buffalo, um, it, it really was accumulation of a lifetime of experience. Um, and so I, I want you to sort of to describe the vision that you had for the Gates Vascular Institute and how you got to it, because you put all these pieces together that you know you had spent decades meeting with these radiologists and vascular surgeons and cardiologists, uh, doing conferences with them, going to their meetings, learning from them. And then you were doing this entrepreneurial thing with Fred and Amar and others. Um, how did you put it all together? And how did you come upon doing this in Buffalo? Well, I think once again, a lot of serendipity and a lot of luck. Um, as you know, must be now over 20 years, well over 20 years, maybe 25 years ago, that um, you know we began to think about failure as a real learning opportunity. And you know, for for your neuro meeting, uh, what is the motto? Um, what is it? Uh, uh, mistakes. Failure. Are the portals of discovery. Yes, exactly. And then, you know, um, one of the things that uh, frustrated me 
in the early stages that you know i had the i had the the desire to do this stuff in the brain with catheters but we didn't have the technology and one of these one of those days i met a cardiologist who was telling me about a a little balloon that they had because we would treat vasospasm with a 3.5 millimeter balloon and with real risk of blowing up the artery those little arteries are not that big and uh, so i went upstairs to the cardiac cath lab and and they had hell they had 1.5 and 2 millimeter catheters and they were even working on a one millimeter catheter and um and they they tracked like butter and so um when we had a patient with vasospasm then i would um you know i would go up to the cardiac cath lab people would always come up looking for me in the neuro lab and i'd be nowhere near <laughs> and then they'd I'd, oh he's probably up in the cardiac cath lab and so i would borrow their catheters and then we found for intracranial stenosis my, their catheters were perfect and uh you could get any any darn size you wanted and so uh, it was um it was a matter of learning from other disciplines that really kind of was another epiphany for me and and then uh we started a meeting i mean you 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 remember when we started a meeting on failure um we call it the failure analysis advisory council but we said hey let's bring in the other disciplines so we invited you know the thought leaders only the thought leaders in cardiology vascular surgery and uh, radiology along with our neuro group and then uh we ended up uh, meeting in jackson hole because it, it was a very confidential kind of meeting and <clears throat> and so what we would do is the group would come together maybe 30 of us and and we would just share our complications and then the insights gained from the other disciplines really really what was an epiphany for me and i saw the, the need for multidisciplinary collaboration and then um larry jacobs who was a dear friend and a neurologist who and he invented beta interferon uh poor guy got cancer and died uh in 1981 and the family uh really wanted to do something to memorialize him and so they approached me a few years later and they said would you help us I said of course I would help you we want to build a neuroscience center and I said I'm not interested um they said well what do you mean what do you want to do um and I uh I said I want to build a multidisciplinary vascular center bring all the disciplines together force them together so that if you want a cup of coffee between cases you're going to find it with a cardiologist or a vascular surgeon not with another neurosurgeon and and so um i presented that case to the jacobs family and they said no 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 that's not what larry wanted i said well okay fine i'm done and then the next thing i knew they had hired consultants and uh, they they had three different consultants and the one that really helped was the tiber group in chicago and i remember uh, one of the guys from the Tiber group after, on his third visit to Buffalo, he finally looked at me across the table and he said, you know what? God damn it. I get it. I understand what you're trying to do. And then he went and told the Jacobs family. And the next thing I knew we had a green light to do a vascular center. And then we had all the politics to get together, to get to, to bring together the, the hospital, the university, all the physicians. We had five competing cardiology groups and and it took two years to kind of bring everything into into uh a central point and a focus where everybody began to get on board with let's do this and then and then we built a uh it, it was the initial cost was 291 million dollars took up a whole city block and um and of course it's grown a lot since then but um but on the fourth floor of that building we put 15 cath labs all the disciplines literally forced together and on the fourth floor all the vascular ors again everybody's together and then and i will never ever forget the day that the our chief of structural cardiology vj was meeting with you 
and and whining that he had a patient that he wanted to do in a, a, a tavern, but the patient had no access from below or from anywhere. And you just said, <laughs> with a cup of coffee in your hand, well, all you got to do is just bring him to me and I'll open up his carotid artery and then you can go right through his carotid. And, and they did. And this was way back. And then I remember one of the nurses said to me, she said, Jesus, that case only took 14 minutes. <laughs> and boy, was that an epiphany. And there have been many since then. But the multidisciplinary interactions were absolutely off the chart spectacular. And that's, we've all been so fortunate to benefit from a building that a Los Angeles architect, um, uh, another wonderful uh, Persian, uh, Meridad Yastani, and when we met with him, we had, out in Jackson, we had about 18 or 19 of the guys that were, we thought were the most innovative in the world. They were all from all over the world. And we started talking about what we wanted to do. And no more than an hour and a half into the conversation, he looked at us and said, I know what you guys want. You want collisions. You want to be forced to bump into each other. He said, I can do that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build you guys a club sandwich. <laughs> and so, so that's what we got. We got the University Translational Research Center on the top floors. So the basic scientists were there. We got the Clinical Vascular Center on the bottom four floors. And he tucked the Jacobs Institute right in the middle and said, the Jacobs Institute is the meat in my club sandwich. And that's how it evolved. So um, it, and it, it's worked out beyond at least my wildest expectations. And I'm sure yours too. Yeah. So you've been able to accomplish so much, whether it's academics or clinical volume or building a center, trailblazing all over the world. Um, I think you still have three times as many miles as I have in terms of air travel. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> How did you manage to keep the home front intact? How did you manage to have this incredible, incredible career? And yet you have an incredible family uh, that is very much together. There's a lot of love and, you know, I remember the time, you know, the summers where grandkids, how, how were you able to manage the family yet be so incredibly exceptionally productive in your academic and entrepreneurial and research pursuits? Well, that's easy. Um, you just marry somebody like <laughs> my wife. So while I was busy running all over the place, Bonnie was raising children. And she always kept me close and in the loop. And so we grew up together with our family. And it was a truly, you know, I, I couldn't possibly have been more fortunate. And I know you are too, that to have such a special person who is running your life and raising your family. And then at, at the work level, it was all about really... Um, Something my dad said from the beginning, if, if you want to be, and, and he ran a company and um, pretty successful one in the mechanical uh, ventilating space. And he said, you want to be successful, you just hire great people and then, um, you know, point them in the right direction, let them do whatever they want to do, get the hell out of their way and then back them up. And if anybody tries to attack them, then you you become like a, a a vicious guard dog, and you protect them, and so I think that's the secret to building a great department. Get great people, and then get out of their way. And if they need encouragement, fine, but don't try to tell them what to do because they're all just as smart or smarter than you are. Well, Nick, thank you so much for just being an incredible boss. Uh, everything you've said, I've experienced personally. Um, and I've learned from you. Neurosurgery is a great career. It's it's incredible joy and expertise. Uh, but many times, um, it 
it feels a little empty when it comes to personalities you can emulate, but you embody in one person absolutely everything which is the best about neurosurgery, about lofty ideals, changing practice, and yet being a deeply committed family man uh, with love and friendship to share. So it's been my greatest honor to uh, <laughs> be associated with you. And I thank you very much for your time uh, today. And uh, I hope uh, people listening to this uh, will get inspired and you know, follow your example. It was, it, was, it was so joyous yesterday to listen to Jay Marco give the Hopkins lecture and talk about everything that he learned from you yesterday. Uh, at the I didn't conference. even know there was one. Well, you have an award named after you and Jay was the recipient this year. <laughs> and it's just a, 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 a wonderful circle of life to see that happening. And you, yeah, I'm most grateful to you as we all are for everything that you've done for us. Well, you guys have been the mainstay for me. I mean, my whole life has, has been you know, professionally, it's been built around you young guys. And I, I can't even begin to tell you how grateful and appreciative I am of all the things you guys, you know, everybody's off on their own career, doing their own thing. But I know everybody, I know everybody cares. And that's, that's pretty special. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much.